you so much uh, and a very respected good morning to all of you. I hope I am audible, but at any point of time, uh, you think that uh, you are not able to hear me, please feel free to interrupt and um, let me know. Uh, at the very outset, I, I wish to extend my heartfelt gratitude uh, to Ritu Madam, to Principal Sir, to and each and everybody who are present here and the organizers of this event. Um, I indeed feel really um, grateful for uh, giving me this chance to share some of my thoughts about, especially with respect to the different dimensions of pedagogy that I'm working on currently. And as uh, Ritu Madam rightly mentioned that I graduated at one point, I spoke about the pedagogy of the stupid. And uh, just to let you know that this particular presentation that I'm going to share with you today on the pedagogy of performative silence is actually a part of the three-part, a three-episode pedagogy series that I'm currently working on. So I started with the pedagogy of the stupid, and um, then it went on to... I can already see there are some comments in the box. I don't know if I'm audible right now. Please let me know. Um, so the pedagogy of the stupid was the first one of that particular series. And the second one is uh, the pedagogy of common sense and the pedagogy of performative silence. Um, now, um, now, coming to the aspect of or the perspective that what exactly I'm trying to do in this particular series. So first, I would like to, to uh, give a background of the pedagogy of the, the, the very series that I'm currently working on. So, and why I'm exactly working on this series. Now, to date, uh, prior to the pandemic situation and also currently in the pandemic situation, we have been discussing, we have been grappling with the fact that what could be some of the possible pedagogical transformations that we can make so that our processes, our habitual processes of teaching and learning can be diversified and made inclusive as much as possible. And this is not something new. We have been doing this for a long, long time across the world. And with respect to that, we have been talking about different forms of pedagogical practices, um, different forms of teaching and learning processes. We have been experimenting across the world that what are some of the ways um, through which we can indulge as many as people as possible to make the process of teaching and learning de hierarchical in nature so that maximum irrespective of people's race class gender age group caste and whatever other factors that we use to create hierarchies can be removed and people can be invited to be a part of this teaching and learning process across the globe without following any kind of hierarchies, without creating any kind of hegemonies. And that is one of the major reasons that actually prompted me to work with these kind of pedagogical practices because with respect to my personal experiences, both as a teacher and a student, I mean, obviously, I don't identify um, myself, uh, I don't identify myself uh, as, as like a teacher separately or a student separately because personally with respect to experiences, I always believe this fact that we are learners and uh, we, we, we learn and we share things all at the same time. So the, the point is we are learning and we are sharing, uh, uh, which we refer to as a te teaching as a, as a kind of parallel process. So we are all somewhere teachers and teachers and learners at the same time. So coming to this particular point, uh, what I really uh, wish to share is that the pedagogy of the stupid emerged from the fact that how often we refer to people or we refer to, uh, you know, uh, to individuals while we teach or while we learn, we have often been said that this is a stupid question or this is such a stupid thought to share. Or your, your, your question makes no sense. Don't ask these kind of questions in the class. This is not a question of a standard of a BA student or an MS student. This likely looks like a middle school question. So, you know, often these kind of discourses, these kind of perspectives often lead to the creation of, you know, a form of discouragement where we feel discouraged 
to share our own thoughts, to share our own perceptions. And that is also one of the various, uh, various reasons why I conceptualized with this perspective of pedagogy of the stupid. And that ultimately transcended into, the, in, into my perceptions of pedagogy of common sense and the pedagogy of performative silence. Now, right now, in this particular lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the very notions of silence and how silence can be performed as a methodology or how silence can be a method of teaching and learning on a habitual basis. Now, I have a few um, slides to share. So I'm just putting up the share. Just let me know if it's... Um, Yeah, so, I mean, just let me know if, if this particular slide is visible to you. And um, so now you, you see that basically this is the, the lecture planning that I have. Yes, yeah, so this is the basic, um, the basic lecture planning that I have here. Uh, and as you can see that I have thought of dividing my lecture basically into three parts. And obviously, I would like to uh, keep it around uh, an hour so that also uh, we have enough time. Uh, we have enough time for uh, to, to basically uh, discuss and share, uh, share questions and thoughts and reflections. Uh, so basically, what we have is in our lecture planner, we have I have tried to divide this lecture into three parts. One is uh, the planetary perception of silence as a form of communication. Uh, number two is conversational silence. And the number three is uh, basically the impact. Now, basically coming to this very planetary perception of silence. Now, we understand this very phenomenon of silence from diverse dimensions. I mean, spiritual dimensions, cultural dimensions. Uh, as principles are also mentioned from various performative dimensions as well, like observing silence at the time of doing a dramatic performance or during a dance performance or various other, other forms of performative aspects as well. And obviously during spiritual through meditation and other uh, diverse forms of religious practices, religious rituals, we observe silence from so many uh, interesting dimensions. Uh, so again, the point is our indulgence with silence as a form of communication is also not a very new phenomenon. And that has been historically, uh, mythologically, historically, culturally, uh, across the world, we have been indulging with this very, very process. Uh, now, the point is, um, now, now the basically what we see is, the, the, the point that we basically find out with respect to uh, with respect to particular silence is that how silence can be indulged as a form of practice of teaching and learning within our daily classroom experiences. That is one very important point that I'm looking forward to focus in this particular lecture of mine. That how we can involve or perform silence when we are indulging in teaching and learning within our classroom spaces inside our educational institutions. But prior to understanding that, it is very necessary for, for us to understand why at all do we need to think about performing silence as a form of pedagogical practice. And this question arises because there are so many crises, there are so many problems and challenges that exist within our daily classroom communication, which are usually centered on our vocal ways of discoursing. That is right now basically what we are doing. We are, we are talking to each other, where we can listen to each other, where we can physically hear each other. So now, but vocal ways of expression, which are the usual forms of expression where we are always expected to um, speak, where we are always expected to talk, where we are always expected to express, share our voices. In such a kind of scenario, what we are expected to do is, we are always requested or required to speak up with respect to our voices. Now, 
there are various challenges if you're always speaking with our voices. Number one is the way to speak also there is always a tendency that while we speak, while we indulging in, in our vocal ways of expression, what happens, there is always a tendency of creating hierarchies. For example, let's take a very simple example. Some kind of discussion is taking place among the students in the class. We often see that maybe one student will shout on other student and will try to silence the other student's thoughts and expressions just because of the fact that it is not acceptable for one person. So you see, vocal ways of communication can be very violent. Vocal ways of communication has always the tendency of creating hierarchies. So usually what we see when we indulge, in, we usually say that if you need to share something, you need to speak up. You can't be silent because by default, the very notion of silence is associated with a form of passiveness. It is believed that if you are silent, if you are not able to speak, if you are simply listening, you are not talking, you are not vocally participating. It means that you are a form of non-functional entity within a classroom space. And as I'm talking about the classroom space, so I'm just taking the example of the classroom space. I mean, you can understand this perspective with respect to other spaces as well. You're most welcome to do that. Now, so let us look into how within usually, and again, not generalizing, but how usually within a particular classroom space, what we need to, how within a particular classroom space, how silence is perceived in usually in a negative connotation. Let us look into some of those points. Let us look into some of those perspectives. Now, coming to this first part in this particular slide, uh, where I talk about the planetary perception of silence as a form of communication. Now, usually what we see, if we are not speaking in the class, we are regarded as someone who is not able to grasp what is being taught in the class. Or it is expected that maybe that person is very shy, or it is sometimes assumed that the person who is not speaking in the class is not enough intelligent to understand what is being taught in the class. So altogether, based on various presumptions, based on various preconceived notions, what, what happens is, the very important thing is that we are perceived as beings who are intellectually infertile. So it's regarded that because I'm silent in the class, so I don't have the capability to think. I am not very smart. Um, I, I don't have the capability to speak up. So I am intellectually, I am intellectually infertile. I cannot think, I cannot speak up. Now the second is, we are, whenever we fail to speak up in the class once again, what is happening is, there is an issue of invalidity. Now, just because I am not speaking up in the class, just because I'm not verbally speaking up in the class, it means that my ways of understanding, my ways of perceiving a particular knowledge is invalid because I am not vocally sharing it. So there is this perception that where we are regarded as invalid entities, that your presence, if you're not speaking up, your presence in the class is not required. Maybe you may not be said by your respective tutor that your presence in the class is not required, but it is with respect to the collective behavior. It is, it, it is with respect to the collective nature or the collective response or the collective attitude of the class towards the students where you are made to feel that just because you don't speak up vocally or verbally you don't speak up, that's why whatever things, your, your thoughts, your ways of expressions, your ways of understanding is invalid. And that actually leads to the third part, the third point, that is, it kind of generates a form of existential lack. Or we are expected that there is a form of, that my existence in the class doesn't really matter. Why? Because I don't verbally express myself. But you see, it is always not necessary that our expressions have to be verbal. I mean, you see, with respect to our facial expressions, with respect to our body languages, 
with respect the way we look at or the way we look at our tutor when we speak or when when we look at each other's faces when our friends speak up also speaks up a lot also communicates a lot but unfortunately on majority of the occasions what happen these forms of or these performances which i refer to as a performances of silence or performance of silence as a form of communication often gets ignored so what happens if i'm not speaking if i'm not verbally expressing and then it happens to be an existential lack and widely if you see uh, what you find is that what is really important is that we also understand it as a form of submissiveness as well so for instance if you're not speaking if you're not shouting at the top of the voice if you're not if you're not enough loud if you're not loud enough to to talk about it means that we are somewhere submissive so whatever people are saying to us we are accepting it blindly no it is not necessary even if i am silent verbally even if i am silent i am not talking it doesn't mean that i that i accept every element what is being spoken and what are, what are being argued inside the classroom and also i mean often during the parents teachers meeting um at least as a school teacher like prior to joining as a lecturer in different universities i used to teach as a phd scholar in one of the schools in varanasi and i i used to see even as a student i used to see that you know during parents teachers meeting teachers will um, uh, complain to the to the parents of many children that you see your, your your child is very well behaved is very decent in the class is very nice in the class but unfortunately he or she doesn't speak up much is very silent he or she needs to participate in the class take you know be a part of the class participate then only the child will find interest but the question is but the question is if we are not verbally or vocally participating who said that there is no participation participation can come in the form of facial expressions participation can come in the form of body languages if as a tutor if i feel it or if i don't feel it relevant to read the facial expressions as a form of communication body languages as a form of communication then it is failure on my part i just can't so you see the very way you know kind of expecting every student to be vocally present in the class expecting every student to be vocally performative in the class is a form of assimilative is a form of assimilative exercise where you have to act according to the whims and fancies of the teacher and you have to act according to the very generalized notion of participation that if you need to participate your participation is only recognized when you vocally and verbally express yourself otherwise you are not regarded that you are participating in the class now why is it so you see it has a longer historical background to understand this issue and among several historical backgrounds obviously it's not possible to share each and every components in it but among several historical backgrounds one major historical dimension that you see here is the very influence of capitalism now you must be wondering for sure that how what capitalism has to do with remaining silent in the class well it has to do see what happened with capitalism is capitalism has imposed among several things one of the major things it has imposed is it has turned or it has converted our spontaneous ways of thinking and expressing into a very mechanically structures into into you know very limited mechanical structures now those mechanical structures expects us to speak in a definite way expects us to dress in a definite way expects us to have some specific parameters of body languages which actually aligns with the structures that have been once created by the european colonial western powers that if you don't dress in this way you are not smart if you don't speak in this way you are not um, you are not modern 
if you don't walk in this way, you are very backdated. You will be perceived as backdated. So, so these form of cages, existential cages that have been created by the European Western powers once upon a time, continue to exist even today in a very invisible form. You don't see the physically visible empire, you know, standing with a whip and slashing us. But it is in a very invisible form where we see that they actually, you know, dissipate through these ways of existence in our daily life, where we often fail to realize that what the ways we are expressing is not our own spontaneous ways of existence, but a form of something which has been imposed upon us by the structures, by the violent structures of capitalism. And this is one of the impact of capitalism, which has taught us that if you have to speak, if you have to express, if you have to validate your knowledge, if we have to validate your thoughts, you have to speak up. That is why, let me give you another very layman's example. If you're working in co corporate sectors, in, 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 at, in any, any field, in any field, if you're as a tutor, you're working in a private college or in some other sectors, a very common thing that you will see, again, I'm not generalizing, but it is a very common thing that you see that where arrogance in the form of a very negative body language, in the form of uh, bad ways of speaking, bad body languages, are being systematized as something smart and being outspoken. And with my personal experiences working in, the, in, a, in a private university at one point of time, every day I struggled with this thing where arrogance, where these arrogance of body languages, arrogance of verbal expressions were perceived as, were normalized and systematized as being vocal, as being outspoken, as being smart. And this is another major reason why I actually indulged in exploring that how as a form of counter resistance to these very capitalistic dimensions of expressions, capitalistic methodologies of teaching and learning could be countered with respect to performing silence. And, th and this is actually this particular argument also feeds to the last point that how in different sectors, in different sections, that if we are not very vocal, if we are not very verbally expressive, we are regarded as you know, physically and psychologically disabled figures. We are unable to speak, we are submissive, we lack, we lack intelligence, we are invalid, etc. Now, having said that, what I'm going to do in the second part of my reflection is that how silence is performed as a daily mode of communication. And there are ample of examples where learning, where we, where we we can involve or we can imbibe those practices within our classrooms in various ways. So obviously, why though I indulge though at the very beginning of my lecture, I say that centrally, I am focusing on how silence can be performed as a form of communication um, within the classrooms. But also, I draw my arguments from various examples and instances of different indigenous and native indigenous communities who have been practicing silence since ages. And again, just to let you know that I have not discovered or invented something new by indulging in, a, in the discourse or by indulging in the argument that how we, can in the, how we can perform silence within the classrooms. What I'm trying to do is, what I'm trying to present here is the necessity of reviving those already existing practices of performing silence within the classrooms, which were once there in place amongst the indigenous communities. Obviously, for them, for them, classroom was not a four-walled structure with desks and benches and a digital board or a blackboard or whatever. Mm -hmm. For them, they, they perceived the very notion of classroom in a very asymplastic, in a very fluid and a wider dimension in connection to nature. So if we understand that as a classroom, we see that performing silence as a method of teaching and learning was well in shape, was well in place within the various indigenous, native indigenous communities across the world. And in fact, even, I mean, though I, 
have uh, like little to no idea about how the native indigenous communities uh, function or share and gain knowledge within the within northeast of India. But I'm for sure that if we let delve into the ways knowledges that are being shared from the uh, between the people amongst the various native indigenous communities in northeast India, I'm pretty sure we would be able to locate the practice of silence or the performance of silence as a way of exchanging knowledges with each other. And it has been in proper place across various native indigenous communities in some way or the other across the world. So just for the, obviously we have a paucity of time. So for sure what, I'm, what I did is I just brought two examples in, in front of us. So to, to, to justify that silence can be performed as a way of teaching and learning on a habitual basis. So the first example, the first example is with the with this uh, Regis Mohawk community tribe in the United States. Um, so, if the the one those of us who take interest in um, in environmental sciences, in environmental literatures, eco criticism, uh, post colonial eco criticism, etc., uh, we must be aware of the fact that it's been for ages. Uh, since the birth of the United States of America, it's been for ages that the native indigenous communities in the United States have been struggling to preserve, to preserve their native indigenous places, have been struggling to preserve their, uh, their original places of birth and existence against the external um, or the extractivist, uh, extractivist uh, projects of the various governing organizations, which are very white-centric, which are very colonially structured. So what happened is that these organizations, in the name of being NGOs, in the name of being welfare workers, in the name of being benevolent actors, they make an effort to, you know, to invade these spaces of the native indigenous communities. And what they try to do is they try to take away and extract their lands first. And then they try to teach the native indigenous communities that how they can preserve their land. So you see this very parallel and simultaneous process of extraction and preservation is so violent. So first of all, for example, I gave an example of environmental protection agency which belongs to the federal government of the United States, the first, they played an active role in supporting the U.S. government to invade these lands of the Regis Mohawk community tribe to take away their land for industries. And as a form of return, they give a small piece of land somewhere and telling them that, you know, as a form of consolation, that you can occupy this land for free and we are not going to charge anything, etc., etc. So these these organizations, first of all, very selectively create that crisis, number one. Now, after creating this crisis, you know, that they try to, you know, present themselves that typical image of being benevolent colonizers. And they try to present this as benevolent colonizers. Oh, I'm so sorry. We have, we have not understood pride. Now we really want to help you out, work for you, etc., etc. And then these people just walk into there and they say, and they try to teach these native indigenous communities how to preserve the land. And this makes these communities absolutely furious. You, if you, if you, there, there is a very interesting article. I, I have also uh, put that article in, in my references list so that uh, you can access that article and read it out. In that article, if you read, you will see that uh, one of the leaders of the community said that we don't need you know, outsiders coming in and teaching us that how to protect the nature. We are the ones who were born and brought up in nature. Since our childhood days, generations after generations, our forefathers have taught us how to live in harmony, in sync, and how to learn and share and care with nature. So we don't need out external organizations to come in and tell us what needs to be done. Number one. Number two, as a form of resistance, they use silence. Now, how do they do that? Usually, again, you will see there is a tendency that in the name of trying to help and collaborate with these indigenous communities, 
or in the name of trying to learn the values of existence from these indigenous communities, many mainstream organizations like the Environmental Protection Agency goes to these communities, try to learn about their medicinal practices, medicinal values, cultures, traditions, comes back, comes out, brands them, and sells them in the market at high price. Even today, you see, for example, uh, across our country, it's a very common thing in India as well, that where it is said that wild honey, you see several brands are coming up, they're, se they're selling in the name of wild honey, which you don't get anywhere in the city. One has to go deep into the forest, gather that. And so what happens, those are sold in the name of brands at high prices. So what is happening, you know, these indigenous, the new way of exploiting these indigenous communities is not always very physically visible. What happens, they are being capitalistically exploited. So knowledges are first of all stolen from them. Indigenous knowledges, indigenous medicinal values are being stolen from them. And then they are taken to some very privileged country in the European West or in the American West. And then they are being branded and sold in the market. And often they are being presented as the discoveries or the inventions of a particular capitalistic brand without even acknowledging that they were well in place and that this have been taken from certain indigenous communities. So being aware of this part, what happened, the Regis Mohawk community tribe have decided that they are not going to share their medicinal values, their medicinal sciences, the way they protect the environment, the way they, the kind of knowledges that they have gained from their forefathers and foremothers to any of the, of these organizations who come to exploit them. So what they do is, you know, in this way, of performing silence, of not speaking up about their about their knowledges, about their sciences, about their mathematics, about their geographies, what they are doing is they are performing silence and keeping these organizations into a state of mystery and not letting them know what is or on what ways they exist or they have been existing across generations. So now what you see here, here this particular aspect of silence is a form of performance of resistance. Here silence is not passive. Here silence is not about intellectual infertility. Here silence is not about a form of stupidity. Here silence is not about a form of disability. Rather, on the contrary, what we see is that silence is being deliberately performed so that one cannot come in and try to exploit them. Similar way, we must be very well aware about how the Kond community in the Kandamal district of Orisha uh, have been for several decades have been struggling to prevent the encroachment of the forest mafias uh, to cut down the trees and clean the lands. And what is really shocking to know is that most of these forest mafias are being encouraged by the, by the forest conservation agencies who, in the dark, collaborate with these forest ma mafias and play a pivotal role in cleaning the forest in the name of development, in the name of constructing factories and industries. So the women in the especially, and what is really interesting, the women playing a pivotal role, which also brings in a gender dimension of performing silence, um, which can actually branch out to many other forms of discourses as well. That how silence is, uh, for instance, how silence uh, for a woman is not always a form of uh, submissiveness, but also a form of strong resistance. But yeah, I mean, that's a diff different side of a discourse. We are not talking about this here. But here, in the context of this uh, Kund community in the Kandamal district of Orisha, where we see that whenever the forest officials come in, the women and the men form a, you know, hold each other hands, you know, form a circle around the trees, and they don't allow them to come forward and cut down the trees. Now, you don't see the men and the women shouting, abusing, rebuking or doing something. They have tried doing that, but it did not work. Still, they saw that their forest lands, their nature, to whom they regard as their mother, 
as their source of inspiration, as their sources of existence for any form of existence, food, geographical, health-wise, and from all other dimensions, were being destroyed. So now, to form a different form, or to, to indulge in a different form of resistance, what they started doing is, they started forming circles, they started weaving circles around the trees. Whenever they saw forest officials approaching, they will form circles, stand in circles around the trees, and not allow them to come forward and cut down the trees. And also, they have been involving in patrolling the entire forest day and night, so that at any point of time, at any point of time, the forest mafias cannot enter and destroy the forest. So here you see another examples of a silent form of performing resistance where you don't shout, where there is no bloodshed, where there is no form of any kind of verbal indulgence, but silently the resistance is performed and it is actually yielding a lot of positive results and it is helping them in a better way to protect the forest as compared to the previous forms of violent verbal resistance. Now, having said that, the point is, the very interesting point is that you see these two examples actually reveal one very important thing, that the performance of silence as a form of pedagogical practice, performance of silence as a resistance, performance of silence of sharing and caring knowledges and preserving indigenous, native indigenous knowledge values is not new. The only problem is that due to our indulgence with various capitalistic ways of sharing and caring knowledges where mostly it is just a function or a performance of dictation and note downs. So the teacher as a dictator who is expected to dictate notes in the class and the student as a silent passive recipient is expected to receive notes, note it down and produce it in the examinations as it is. And this practice of pedagogy is very much functional in several educational institutions from schools to colleges to higher research education institutions till date. Even at the university level, we see that the often the research scholars complain that their supervisors have imposed a topic on them and actually dictated the student to do on this topic. Otherwise, the student will be thrown out of the supervision of the supervisor's uh, you know, uh, team. So you see, these form of examples, these form of experiences continue to exist, which needs to be thoroughly interrogated, which needs to be thoroughly questioned. And silence can be a very strong way of countering, uh, you know, countering these form of hierarchies, these form of dictatorial modes of sharing and gaining knowledges. Now, coming to this part, having said this, how silence can be performed in the classroom? And here, basically what I'm going to do is, I'm going to give, you know, three examples. I mean, there can be obviously many examples, but I have selected just three examples to share. Um, so the first thing is, I mean, it's a very common, um, you know, it's a very common experience that when we are, when we used to be, you know, very small, and more or less, more or less, many of us does that. To stand in front of the mirror, uh, make faces just for fun. To stand in front of the mirror, make faces, do different types of faces, do different forms of sounds, different forms of hand movements, um, you know, bodily expressions without speaking anything. And, you know, it's always, uh, you know, it's also sometimes very funny to look at the different forms of faces that actually we can make or how in different ways we can express. Now, as a, I perceive this very exercise, you know, I critically perceive this very exercise as a very prominent form of performing silence. Usually, we ignore this exercise as something, you know, the child is a small child, the child acts crazy, the child is not matured. But the point is, if we indulge ourselves critically into these kind of, uh, try to look this particular performance from a critical dimension, we can see that it has the capability 
to actually understand is from various logical dimensions. Now, usually to see that when a child makes different forms of sounds, if we look from a psychological perspective, when the child makes different forms of sounds, what the, tri what the child tries to understand is that how he or she can express himself or herself from in so many ways. Or what Sorry. are some of the factors that actually enables himself or herself to make so diverse forms of facial expressions or to make so such diverse forms of body movements, to make so diverse forms of, uh, you know, uh, physical movements or hand movements or feet movements. So the child keeps on wondering from a psychological dimension, if we see the child keeps on wondering that what or why he or she is able to do such kind of movements in front of the mirror. And this very process of wondering is itself a scientific question. If at that point of time, if we can really encourage the child to do that more often, to consciously do that more often by looking in front of the mirror and trying to understand the jaw movements, trying to understand the feet movements, trying to understand the body movements, trying to understand how the hand can be brought down, brought up, etc., how the face and the jaws and how the sound just emanates itself from in different ways from the different parts of our mouth and the vocal cord. It's itself allowing the child consciously to do this and letting the child know that there are different scientific reasons in doing that is itself a way of educating the child in the form of silence. And also the process is so creative rather than ignoring it as something very childish, as something very immature, it is done by the child or it is a kind of unconscious act. We have the, we have the potential to let the child know that this is also a way of learning. This is also a way of learning about the sounds, about the biology, about the movements, about the physical movements, about the facial movements, etc. So standing in front of the mirror when the child does that, what we can do is, what, what is actually important is to encourage the child to do that rather than just ignoring it or laughing at it or simply saying it is as a childish act. Number two, the number two example actually comes with respect. The first example is obviously respect to my own self. Uh, you know, making faces in front of the mirror as a child, whatever little bit I remember, and also about the different kind of physical movements that I used to do unconsciously as a child in front of the mirror. Number two is that as a teacher, as I mentioned that while I was doing a PhD, I, I, I was teaching in a school in Varanasi. And uh, one thing I observed in the classrooms is that the kind of hectic life that they all had, so the periods, the each and every class periods, um, what we see is that it would be for around 45 minutes. But often the teachers in the name of rushing with the syllabus and trying to complete it will not give that 15 minutes break between each class to the students. They will cover up that 15 minutes. The students will then struggle to come out. Some will rush to the washroom. Some need some fresh air. But by the time they're able to do that, the next teacher comes in. If they're not in the class, they're scolded, they're punished, they're penalized. But why were you outside the class? And so what happened? In the long run, it seemed that the interest to study, the, the very process of teaching and learning becomes a mechanical process. It just becomes a, a kind of habitual emotional rest ritual where the student walks in the class just need to do the notes and, you know, need to complete the syllabus for the sake of examination, for the sake of degrees, and that's over. And when I started teaching, I tried to, I tried to figure out that how come, at least in case of my class, how can I create that enthusiasm, create that interest among the students, not just for the sake of learning, for the sake of examination and good grades, but learning for the sake of fun, learning for the sake of, uh, you know, for the sake of interest, learning for the sake of bringing practical transformations in the society. And what I basically did is one major thing that I followed is that whenever I entered the class, the first 10 minutes, the five to 10 minutes went into meditation. Now, meditation 
what did I request the students to do or what kind of or what kind of meditation that I suggested them to do. I always say that keep aside your books and copies, pen and paper, because they look so panicky. Every time you enter the class, they are kept with their books and copies open and ready to take down notes. Even before the teacher is ready to speak, they are just very ready to take down the notes, which actually didn't make me feel many teachers um, you know, appreciated this as a form of sincerity. But for me, it was a totally contrasting thing. I felt that they are so much terrorized that when they come in, when they, when they sit in the class and they're just ready with the notes, they have no space to breathe and relax. So what is required is the first thing that I told them, and even I do even today's class as well, they just don't rush with your books and copies and sit with the notes. Relax. Listen, think, breathe, and then let's engage. So I immediately I said them to keep aside their books, copies, and notes aside, close their eyes, breathe softly, and think about a very recent positive thing that has happened in their life. A very recent, it might be something from the morning, it might be something from seven days back, it might be something one year back, or whatever it is, but to think about a positive a very positive, transformative, uh, happy thing that has happened in their life in a recent past. And to focus on that event. How did that event unravel? How did that happen? What were the facts that contributed towards developing that happy, positive event? Now, what happened is that... It is very, it had very interestingly positive impact on the students. I mean, obviously, you can't expect that every student will say that I had a great impact. There are some students who say that it is not making any difference. There are some students who complain that, uh, I mean, we can't concentrate. But also, there were students who said that it had contributed towards their capability to think that how much they think less and work more. Because what happens in this very mechanical process of our existence, what happens, you know, producing research papers, attending conferences, getting certificates, you know, API points, promotions, salary increments, etc., etc. We are stuck in a state of completely a very mechanical state of existence. We, in the process of doing that, we start, we, we become very robotic in nature. And as a result, what happened, or what really happens is that the point we, we lose, we lose our process of fun or frolics of teaching and learning. We lose the very experience of happiness. We lose the very experience of fun that is involved in the teaching of learning and the learning of teaching as well. And what happens in the process, so that is one of the major things that I try to restore among the students in my class. And many students say that how this process of meditation has made them feel that they're always in a state of rush to mug up things and produce. And that is how much they have stopped thinking. And this process of meditation actually in the long run, in many ways with the passage of time, has enabled them to think. And the process of thinking has to be there in a silent manner. But very unfortunately, these very capitalistic systems of education prevent us from thinking. For example, um, if I give another very practical example, we often see in the classroom where the teachers say that if I ask you a question, you have to promptly answer. If I ask you a question, you have to answer it immediately. And often with respect to my experience as a student, I've seen that if a student took a long time to answer, took a long time to think, immediately the student fell victim to the teacher's rebuke that you are not studying properly, you are not enough intelligent, you are not thinking, you are wasting your time, you should not be in the class, etc. Which is actually ethically, logically very problematic. I mean, even if I know everything, I mean, everything in the sense with respect to a particular subject or with respect to a particular question, even if I know that ab about that question, I need time to sink in, to construct my thoughts 
and then to express. And that silence, the, the, the moment I am silent and I'm thinking, I am not, but I am actually performing something. I am expressing, I am performing a way of communication. I am silently thinking, it doesn't mean that I am kind of distracted with something else or I am unable to answer or I am I don't have the capability to address that question, etc. These kind of preconceptions, these kind of misnomered notions need to be thrown out of our daily ways of our communication, daily ways of teaching and learning. So you see, these intermittent silences within the classroom while we think, while we meditate, while we listen is very important to be acknowledged. It is very important to acknowledge these silences. These silences are not inactivities. These silences are equally or more active than our regular modes of our verbal expressions. Number three point, which is very interesting, just to let you know, uh, that New Delhi, since, since 2018, the government, um, so far it has been implemented amongst the government schools. The government schools in New Delhi, we find that they have cons started conceptualizing the happiness curriculum. Now this happiness curriculum is very much there, which is actually widely drawn from the very notion of gross national happiness that we see uh, is very much in practice in Bhutan. It's a place where I taught for one and a half years. Uh, this year only I, I came back from Bhutan prior to joining here as a postdoctoral fellow. And there it was very interesting to see that how happiness is not looked as just as a form of experience of laughing and being satisfied eternally, but also conscious logical practice where we teach happiness where we learn happiness where we share happiness and through concrete pedagogical practices there is a well outlined plan obviously uh, I mean we don't don't have much time to share about the very happiness index how it works in the schools but just to let you know very briefly that there is a well outlined curricular structure where students are not only taught within the four world classrooms or in the science labs but also students are taken right in the middle of the nature, where they learn with the transformations, where they learn silently with nature, with respect to the color of the leaves, with respect to the the, the way crops are grown, with respect to uh, maintaining a garden, with respect to maintaining a fruit orchard, etc. Students get first-hand experiences in a silent manner, where actually they learn in a silent manner from nature, where they don't verbally communicate with nature, but just they closely observe nature, the transformations in nature, the growth of nature, the withering away of nature, and this is how they learn science, mathematics, technology, medicine, and so many interesting things. And this is something which is being introduced by the very government schools in New Delhi as well, by the Education Ministry in New Delhi, and they call it as the happiness curriculum. And what is the happiness curriculum? To make a long, to cut a long story short, uh, it, it is, uh, you know, underpinned with a threefold concept that is momentary happiness, deeper happiness, and sustainable happiness. Now, what is momentary happiness? Momentary happiness is, for example, we are eating, we are speaking, we are laughing, we are talking, we are using our senses to do different things. We are feeling happy for a certain moment of time. That's momentary happiness. But is momentary happiness everything? No. We want to expand this momentary happiness into a more deeper version of happiness. So, for example, I remember um, when I was in a, when I was in, in one of the schools, I had the privilege of a very nice class teacher. During our lunch breaks, we used to sit in the classroom and have. Our teacher always used to say that when you are eating, don't talk a lot. Don't speak so much. Now, we used to, now other teachers would say if you speak so much, your, your, your voice is going to, you know, uh, you are going to get choked food is going to enter in your uh, throat, you are going to fall ill, etc. But that particular class teacher gave a very interesting dimension. 
she say that if you are talking so much how you will be able to enjoy your food eating is not just munching it or eating is not just getting a few tastes of uh, you know salt bitter sweetness etc eating is a way of living eating is a way of enjoying eating is a way of developing love and care towards one's culture because you see so many students coming in from different cultural and social backgrounds bringing in different things and sharing with each other that if i love the taste or i don't love the taste but what is happening in the process of that exchange is we are developing cultural values we are developing cultural sustainability we are developing love and care towards each other so that is why you know happiness curriculum is something that through its performances in the form of meditation in the form of exercises in the form of cultural performances in the form of pedagogical practices in closeness with nature which is practical and also it enables the students to understand how those pedagogical practices can be implemented towards causing social transformations is actually what is happiness curriculum talking about and that actually leads to deeper happiness i gave this example of this lunch break as a form of deeper happiness where we are where the taste it often happens for example that we are going into a restaurant we are having such a delicious food that it remains within us till we are alive and it happens with me as well something that i had 10 years back still i remember the taste it was so fascinatingly tasty so you see that was not just a momentary happiness it was a deeper and sustainable happiness as well because why do we need deeper and sustainable happiness so that we not only become we, we are not only happy by our own selves but at the same time what we are doing is we are expanding that happiness and sharing with each other we are expanding this happiness and ensuring that not only i am happy but happiness weaving a collective entity weaving a collective thread where we share and care happiness with and for each other and that is another aspect of teaching and learning that we should try to nurture individually and collectively in our habitual life the teaching and learning not just for the sake of writing and conferences and certificates and promotions and salary increments but also to ensure that what we are learning what we are indulging into is also a form of happiness it gives us happiness it gives us an eternal form of satisfaction and if we see in our habitual mechanical ways of our teaching and learning we often see that how much this happiness how much this satisfaction actually is withering away gradually now coming to the very last part and i'll quickly wrap it up so that uh, uh, we make sure that uh, we have uh, enough time to address the questions uh, what i would like to say is that in part 3 what i'm trying to say is the quick impact the first is that how so what are some of the impacts that we see of this pedagogy of performing pedagogy of you know per performing silence as a form of habitual pedagogical practice is expanding our epistemological and ontological horizons to simplify these jargonized you know terms what we can do is epistemological refers to the systems of knowledges and ontological refers to the ways of knowing our own self ways of knowing our own being so what we say is expanding the epistemological and the ontological horizons in a way when we perform silence in the process of thinking in the process of expressing in the process of nurturing in the process of caring and sharing we are expanding our ways of understanding we are expanding our ways of knowing we are expanding our ways of learning which every time is not possible through verbal communication because as i mentioned at the very beginning verbal communication often forces us not to think not to be silent next is performing disciplinary carnivalis but i will come to this point just at the last so i will jump into intersectional pedagogy the another thing is just to let you know when i am talking about performing silence as a form of pedagogical practice 
I do not mean that it has to be complete silence. What I'm proposing is that there should be a blend of silence, silent and vocal practices of expressions within the classrooms and beyond when we indulge in this process of teaching and learning. I mean, as we value vocal expressions, we should give equal or in at some certain circumstances more importance to the silent practices of expressions as well. Another very important thing is it also allows us to check our predeterminations that, oh, silence means um, it, it's passivity, silent means we are invalid, silence means we are intellectually dumb, silent means that we are not intelligent. So all these kind of, uh, you know, worthless predeterminations that we live with is something that are questioned and dismantled while performing silence. Now coming to the last point, as I say, and with which I would like to end my session, is performing disciplinary carnivalesque. Now we know, uh, those of us who have read Bakhtin, that carnivalesque is a wonderful exercise where the moment a carnival is performed, where the moment a carnival takes place, people with paints, colorful dresses, as they dance and sing in a frenzy with each other, that very moment, all forms of class, caste, racial, geographical, political, and other forms of pre-existing differences collapse. Utilizing this concept within the dimension of pedagogy or within the dimension of academic disciplines, it is very important for us to indulge in a performance of disciplinary carnivalesque where we shed off, we shed off our predeterminations towards understanding and acknowledging certain disciplines as better or certain disciplines as meant for more intelligent people than others. It is a very common thing, at least I have experienced, that if you are getting high percentage of marks in your, um, in your 10th boards, you are expected to be a science stream student, a bit less than that commerce stream student. If you have failed or you were on the verge of failing, or if you have received very poor percentage of marks, you have to study with something. It means you are going to join arts so that people don't make fun of you. And at least, hello, this, this poor boy or this poor girl is studying with something. So disciplinary carnivalists, and it is still very much persistent, maybe not so much as it used to be in my time as a class 10 student back in 2006. It may not be so impactful in 2021, but it is still very much persistent. So that needs to be questioned. And that is where the disciplinary carnival is where that we don't indulge ourselves with preconceived or predetermined notions of approaching a particular discipline. But we perform a form of carnivalis by understanding each and every discipline in connection with each other. So we cannot say, we cannot say science is different from obviously technically, structurally. In terms of contact, indeed, each and every discipline is different from each other. But it is important to build bridges, to weave bridges between different disciplines, between different disciplines, between one discipline to another, where we can say that, you know, the, to, to explore the connection between science, humanities, sociology, history, mathematics. For instance, a lot of these activities are gradually coming up. We see that in many universities across the world, in many educational research institutions across the world, where people are working with the history of science, or people are working with the, the, the science of religion. So you see, you know, these form of interactions or these modes of expressions or these modes of collaborations actually enables us to understand that no discipline stands as a individual hierarchical authority over other disciplines. All the disciplines are interwoven with each other. Without one discipline, another discipline cannot exist. So this is something that disciplinary carnivalesque, where the very moment we realize the interwovenness of different disciplines and where we understand the different, different relationships between various disciplines, it is at that very moment we perform or indulge in an act of disciplinary carnivalesque. So, okay, I have spoken enough, so I will right away stop here.
And um, thank you so much, all of you, for your patience and for listening to me. And it would be great now to receive some reflections, criticisms, comments, and questions. Thank you so much once again.